Cordoba's centerpiece is a massive former mosque, or in Spanish, mesquita. This huge rectangle dominates the tangled medieval town that surrounds it. Grand gates lead to the courtyard. It was here, when this was a mosque, that worshippers would gather to wash before prayer, as directed by Muslim law. Entering, you step into a forest of delicate columns and graceful arches dating from over a thousand years ago. At its zenith, this mosque was the center of Western Islam and the heart of a cultural capital that rivaled Baghdad and Constantinople. A wonder of the medieval world, it's remarkably well-preserved, giving today's visitors a chance to appreciate Islamic Cordoba in its 10th century prime. The columns and arches seem to recede to infinity, as if reflecting the immensity and complexity of God's creation. The mihrab, the focal point of worship in a mosque, was built in the mid-10th century. It's richly mosaic with 3,000 pounds of tiny, multicolored glass and enamel cubes. A painting in the adjacent treasury takes us back to 1236, when Christians conquered the city and everything changed. Here we see the Spanish king accepting the keys to Cordoba's fortified gate from the vanquished Muslims. According to legend, one morning Muslims said their last prayers in the great mosque. That afternoon, the Christians set up their portable road altar and celebrated the first mass in what would later become this glorious cathedral. As if planting a cross into its religious heart, this grand cathedral was built in the middle of the mosque. Taking two centuries to complete, the cathedral is a glorious mix of Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque styles. A statue actually called St. James the Morslayer stands next to the altar. Sword raised as usual, James is busy conquering Muslims. Other art is less provocative. The Baroque-era choir stalls are made of New World mahogany. With exquisite carving, it's considered one of the masterpieces of 18th century Andalusian Baroque. And towering over the former mosque, a bell tower makes it clear this huge edifice now houses a place of Christian worship. Founded as a Roman camp in the first century, Leon gradually grew prosperous and was the capital of its own kingdom for centuries. Today's Leon is the youthful leading city of one of Spain's biggest provinces. Its 13th century Gothic cathedral, towering dramatically over the town center, must have stoked the spirit of medieval Christians. Through the Middle Ages, the steady flow of pilgrims from all across Europe inevitably resulted in a rich exchange of knowledge, art, and architecture. That's one reason why today, all along the Camino, you find magnificent churches and exquisite art. Just down the street, the relatively humble Church of San Isidoro houses some of the most sublime medieval art in all of Spain. This royal pantheon, nicknamed the Sistine Chapel of the Romanesque Age, is the final resting place of 20 kings of Lyon. Painted around the year 1100, this is a rare opportunity to see Romanesque frescoes in situ, where they were originally intended. The art shows a realism and movement rare in Romanesque art. Stepping under these vaults, I can imagine the pilgrim centuries ago, awestruck by this mystic beauty. The angel announces to Mary with billowing robes, she'll give birth to the Messiah. All of nature, including goat herders in 11th century attire, celebrates the news. The story of Christ's life unfolds from there, ending with the events leading up to the crucifixion. After Jesus is condemned, Simon helps carry his cross. Pontius Pilate washes his hands of the whole business, and Jesus is crucified. Finally, Christ returns, triumphant over death, sitting on a rainbow, and blessing those 20 royal tombs. After over a month on the trail, spirits are high as well-worn pilgrims reach their final stop, the city of Santiago de Compostela. Around the last corner, they reach the destination of a thousand years of pilgrims, the cathedral that holds the tomb of St. James. As millions of weary yet exhilarated pilgrims have done before them, they stand before the cathedral and are filled with jubilation. But the religious climax for many lies within the cathedral. 
Imagine you're a medieval pilgrim. You've just walked 500 miles. Your journey is done. Worshiping before the altar, you give thanks to St. James for a safe passage, and you reflect on the lessons of your journey. And if you're here on a festival day, the mass culminates with an enormous swinging incense burner. Gazing at the spectacle of this 120-pound burner flying through the air, you're awestruck by the wonder of God. Finally, you climb the stony staircase behind the altar to the statue of St. James, studded with precious gems. Embracing him from behind, you take a moment to celebrate your spiritual or personal triumph. For five centuries, Burgos was the capital of the Kingdom of Castile. It's dominated by an awe-inspiring Gothic cathedral designed by French architects in the 13th century, with its lacy spires added by German architects in the 14th. The ornate exterior is matched by its lavish and brightly lit interior. In Spain, the final flowering of the Gothic age was the elaborate plateresque style. As was typical of Gothic churches, it's ringed by richly decorated chapels built over the centuries by and for wealthy parishioners. This chapel is dedicated to Saint Anne, the Virgin Mary's mother. Its 15th century altar features the Tree of Jesse. A sleepy and apparently very fertile Jesse slumbers at the bottom, sprouting a lineage that connects him to the Holy Child and Virgin. This sumptuous chapel marks the tomb of a regional governor and his wife under a brilliant star-shaped vault. It's striking for its gracefulness and femininity. Toledo, Spain's leading Catholic city, has a magnificent cathedral. Shoehorned into the old center, its exterior rises brilliantly above the medieval clutter, and the interior, so lofty and vast, is celebrated as the most Gothic of Spain's churches and the most Spanish of Gothic churches. Wander among the pillars and imagine when the light bulbs were candles and the tourists were pilgrims. And for worshipers, past and present, the windows provide spiritual as well as physical light. Marvel through the Iron Gate at one of the most stunning altars in all of Spain. The complex composition shows the story of Jesus' life, from his birth in the manger to his death on the cross. While the centerpiece holds the Holy Communion bread and wine, the entire altar conveys the Christian message of salvation through Christ. While well, the cathedral is primarily a place of worship, its sacristy and treasury have enough jewels, great paintings, and other art to put any museum on the map. The delicate charms of Santa Cruz are just a few steps from Sevilla's immense cathedral. It's the third largest church in Europe, after St. Peter's in the Vatican and St. Paul's in London, and the largest Gothic church anywhere. When they ripped down the mosque that stood on this site in 1401, the Reconquista Christians bragged, we'll build a cathedral so huge that anyone who sees it will take us for madmen. You could fit a soccer field in here. Everything is supersized. The towering main altarpiece is covered in gold leaf. Constructed in the 1480s, it's composed of hundreds of figures. It tells the story of the life of Jesus in 40 scenes from his birth to his resurrection. The choir, an enclosure within the cathedral for more intimate services, surrounds a spinnable music rack. It held giant hymnals, large enough for all to chant from in an age when there weren't enough for everyone. In the transept, four pallbearers carry the tomb of Christopher Columbus. They represent the four medieval kingdoms that became Spain. Aragon, Navarra, Castile, and Leon each identified by their team shirts. Columbus even traveled a lot after he died. He was buried first in Sevilla, then moved to Santo Domingo, then to Cuba, and after Cuba earned its independence from Spain around 1900, he sailed all the way back here to Sevilla. Is he really in there? 
Sevillanas like to think so. All that survives of Moorish Sevilla's main mosque is its courtyard of orange trees and a towering minaret. The tower offers a brief recap of the city's history, sitting on a Roman foundation, a long Moorish period, capped by the Christian age. The Moors built its spiraling ramp to accommodate a rider on horseback. Somebody climbed this tower five times a day to call Sevilla's Muslims to prayer. Today, tourists gallop up for fine city views. And the former minaret functions as the cathedral's bell tower. It's topped with a bronze weather vane, a statue that symbolizes the triumph of faith. Gaudi's most famous work is his unfinished Church of the Holy Family, or Sagrada Familia. He worked on it for over 40 years until his death in 1926. Work continues on the church, which is not expected to be completed for another 50 years. The nativity facade, the only part of the church essentially finished in Gaudi's lifetime, shows the architect's original vision, mixing Christian symbolism, images from nature, and the organic flair of modernisme, it's an impressive example of Gaudi's unmistakable style. The more modern passion facade has a different yet complementary style. In the soaring nave, Gaudi's columns blossom with life. Gaudi was a devout Catholic. Part of his religious vision was a love for nature. He said, nothing is invented, for it's written in nature first. His little windows let light filter in like the canopy of a rainforest, creating space for an intimate connection with God. Stepping into this monumental construction zone, visitors see the slow and steady progress and what their steep admission fee is funding. Like the construction of great churches through the ages, this project takes many lifetimes. Gaudi knew he'd never see it finished, as do the architects working on it today. Yet they all contribute, pushing steadily toward completion. Someday, a central 550-foot-tall Tower of Jesus will rise above all this. It'll dwarf everything we see today. The vision? To shine like a spiritual lighthouse, visible even from out at sea. If there's one building on Earth I'd like to see, it's Sagrada Familia, finished.